on this absolutely glorious, sunshiny day we're going to have today. It's coming. Sunshine is coming. All right. Today is announcements. Uh, we had a switch. Uh, Don graciously agreed to switch with Mike because Mike had a, a previous commitment. So we thank Don and welcome him to our opening. And uh, that's the only announcement I have. Move on to Joy. Gary is here. He had his procedure. He has just a small blockage that they're going to take care of with medication. So praise Jesus on that one. And I don't have any prayer requests. Okay. Barbara. Barbara. Was the name? Barbara Minton. My aunt Teal. I was going to do a demo appointment in a wheelchair and was luckily in the head on the next day. 11 stitches in the head, 16 stitches in the knee, broke the nose, oh, and that's what I'm going to make for six months and she's coming with 91. Oh, oh my gosh. Barbara Minton. Minton. Sharon? I'm Tony and Linda LaBruza for health concerns. Both of them? Yeah. Oh, oh. And the family of Christine DePlanis. She passed away suddenly. That's Katina's 40-year-old sister-in-law. Okay. Christina DePlanis. And uh, Brenda Petrie, uh, Paul's mom, is having some health issues. I find Brenda to be a miracle in and of herself. Just keep me in prayer for a good man of Brian with them. Okay. Just put a pin on that. I need all the prayers I can get. Amen. Yes. We got them, honey. We got them. that you would guide us into whatever it is you want us to become to serve you better and more efficiently and effectively. We lift up uh, the Presbytery of South Louisiana, the Presbyterian Church USA, and all Christian entities in your world, Lord, that we could truly unite and move your cause forward rather than our individual nitpicking differences, Lord. We just lift that up to you, Don, giving you love. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Don today as he prepares to deliver the word, that it would flow through him and into our hearts, and we would be moved to do your work in your world. Your world that continues to be broken. There are wars, there are rumors of wars, there are conflicts, Lord. We would just ask that you would unharden the hearts of your people, that they could find common ground, that we could have peace, especially be with Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia, our own country in the Middle East. We lift the leaders up to you. We ask that you would grant them wisdom Lord, we also ask, as the election season comes up, that you would send us a candidate that we could back because he would be willing to do your work and glorify you. We just lay that at your feet, Lord God. Lord, we lift up Barbara Minton. You know her maladies. You realize her age. 
We just ask that you would put your hand of healing and restoration upon her. We lift up Tony and Linda LaBruza. You know them well, Lord. That you would just be with them. Lift them up. Give them strength. Give them healing, Lord. We lift up Brenda Petrie. You know her needs. You've been with her through her journey. We just ask that you continue to be with her and heal her. We lift up Karen, that she would have good results on her procedures, her tests, Lord, that she would be clean and clear. We lift up Crystal and Jenny. Lord, you know their health issues. You know what's going on in their bodies. We would ask that you would guide their doctors, that they could minister to them, <coughs> heal them, restore them. We lift up the family of Christina Duplantis, Lord. We would ask that you would give them comfort and strength and peace as we ask for all who are in grief, who are mourning, who have lost loved ones, Lord. Peace, comfort, and strength. Lord, we are thankful for Gary's good news. We give you all the praise and all the glory and we ask that you continue to be with us. Lord, as we stand before you today, we confess that we are sinners and indeed in need of redemption. We know when we confess to you that our sins are forgiven. So right now, in this moment of silence, we come before you confessing our individual sins and lifting up our individual Lord, we have three more days of the Mardi Gras season. We ask, Lord, that you would <clears throat> bring a protection to the riders and to the watchers. We ask that people would use this opportunity to share your love and your peace and your grace. Lord God, in all we do and all we say and all we ask, we do that in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. I forgot to mention Marl. Uh, Marl uh, Black is up and down. Don is in the hospital with a bleeding ulcer. So Marl is just torn between the two places. And they definitely, that family needs our prayer. Good morning again and welcome to God's house. Um, excited to be here and worship with y'all. Um, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have to go to Morning City after this. So um, I'll, we don't have to rush through this. Um, I'll trim my message down to where I sh we should be out by 1130. So <laughs> I'm so glad you're Good news. Thank you so much. Okay, good. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I forgot much. <laughs> we have places we can get much. Um, let us join in our call to worship. Do we put that up here? No call to worship. Okay. Then we let us start with our first hymn uh, in the blue book, number four sixty-seven. How great thou art. Four sixty-seven. Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. 
So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets of Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. The second reading is from Psalms 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God himself is judged. The reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 At this time, it's a time that we give back to the Lord a portion of our blessing.
to use these gifts to fulfill your word here on earth. Then hear us as we pray the prayer your Father taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I gotta put it in there. one we had been using. We can go back to the other one too. I don't know. We, 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 we still working out the kinks on our uh, new new old order. <laughs> we had we had it done in about four or five years. <laughs> Um, this is kind of what brought some confusion between me and 
Um, the lady who um, winds up the. Uh, Dale. 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 I'm so sorry, Dale. <laughs> I, I, I asked Dale what if y'all had a um, Ash Wednesday service, and she said, I don't know, let me find out. And then she called me and said, Yes, and we're so excited you're going to come. And I said, Oh, I can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like. Uh, let me use the word I want to use. Uh, and the reason why I was asking her is because on those holidays or feasts or celebrations in our church that don't fall on a Sunday, we never get to celebrate them. We celebrate Transfiguration of our Lord. For, you know, we've celebrated it in the past. And uh, we've certainly celebrated Ash Wednesday in the past. So I'm going to roll our lectionary forward to Ash Wednesday. And that was my purpose for asking Dale. Um, but the good news is, we have an Ash Wednesday service in Raceland, and you're all welcome to come celebrate with us. We have the disposition of ashes, and we start at 6 o'clock Wednesday. So you all come join us. So I'll be reading from Matthew 6, and my message will be based on this, uh, verses 1 through 6. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from them, from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give, do give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your, to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. There are very, very, very few people who never, ever get angry about anything even if you're the most mild-mannered person out of mild-mannered people, you have a hot button. That if someone just knows where it is and knows where to push it, it will make your blood boil. What's one thing that makes you all the angriest? Is it when somebody cuts you off on the highway and, and you have a little road rage behind the wheel? Or maybe it's when your brother or your sister borrows borrow something from you and it never gets returned. Maybe it's when your favorite college football team or your favorite pro football team loses to a team that you know is not as strong because us couch coaches know they did not run the right way. <laughs> Maybe it is a certain politician or political party that makes you extremely angry. For me, I had to calm down driving here this morning because I couldn't find a pair of socks <laughs> that matched. <laughs> socks are a pet peeve of mine. They must be with the Tupperware lid. <laughs> because you never can find two that match. And my daughter, whose her chore chore is to fold the stuff that gets dry, can't fold socks. <laughs> <laughs> but you know who else has a hot button? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ also has a hot button. There was one thing that literally made his blood boil. It set him on fire. It would turn his temper on in a heartbeat. That one thing is hypocrisy. No fewer than seven times does Jesus use hypocrisy, denouncing the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, in one chapter in Matthew? 
in chapter 23, verses 13, 14, 15, 23, 25, 27, and 29, he denounces the hypocrites. So what is it about hypocrisy and hypocritical people that made Jesus so angry? There are two things about hypocrites that just really ticked him off. He said in Matthew 23, verse 3, for they say things and do not do them. Then even when they do something mean, meaningful, he went on to say, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. That's in Matthew 23, verse 5. In other words, these hypocrites would publicly talk the talk, but privately they don't walk the walk. The hypocrites he was talking about in all these passages was the Pharisees. So I'd say one of Jesus' favorite sayings is, don't be a hypocrite. I realize that one of the biggest excuses, and this is so sad, for people not coming to church is because some people say the church is full of hypocrites. <laughs> the truth to the matter is there is hypocrisy both inside and outside the church. There's hypocrisy in all of us. We all can be a little hypocritical at times. So let's talk about three don'ts that we can probably practice that will keep us from being hypocrites. The first one is don't pretend to be somebody you're not. It was pointed out earlier that Jesus' favorite word for the religious leader of the day was the term in this passage we read this morning, Jesus uses this word two times. He calls them hypocrites in their giving, in verse 2, and in their praise, in verse 5. It is so sad that so many people link Christianity with hypocrisy. One skeptic, I read this, wrote these words, a Christian is a man who feels repentance on a Sunday for what he did on Saturday, and he's getting ready to do it again on Monday. That's really sad. That is pretty sad. Many, many people today, quite frankly, connect ministers and pastors with hypocrisy. So this is nothing new. The word that Jesus used for hypocrisy is the Greek word for actor, which literally does give us the word hypocrite. When translated in Greek to actor to hypocrite. One of the major forms of entertainment back in the day of Jesus and the Greek culture was the theater. Live theater. Greek and Roman actors would wear these huge masks and costumes designed to increase their size and appearance. They would wear platform shoes to make themselves look taller and more grander. In other words, they did everything they could to make themselves appear to be something that they really were not. They would wear different masks to portray different emotions or different scenes or different parts of the act, and that is why they were called hypocrites. Sometimes they would wear one type of mask and sometimes they would wear another type the same way for our modern actors today. They put on heavy makeup and perhaps wear specially designed costumes or will pad their clothing to make them look bigger or stronger to project an image that appears to be real, but it's really not. It's false. The word hypocrite soon took on the connotation of someone who treats the world as a stage on which he is playing a part. He tries to make himself appear to be something that he really is not. His actions don't match his words. There is this one person that can walk the Bible <coughs> from end to end, but never uses those words. There's the person who sits in a small group on Sunday morning to pretending to be pious and religious, but then unfortunately entertains his female friend in his home while his wife is at the ladies' party club meeting on Monday night. There's the person who goes to church, never misses, 
and gets all the blessings of the church, but never financially supports the church and helps the church to continue, to, to be able to continue its mission, reaching people for Christ. Jesus was talking about people who play games. <coughs> they play these games of religious <coughs> make-believe. They know all the cues. They know what to say, what to say, when to say it, and when to do it. But privately, they have no part of God in their heart. Those are the hypocrites. Those are the true hypocrites. Call it whatever you want. Putting up a front, wearing a mask, putting on a show. But the Bible says it's hypocrisy. What God wants us to do is simply just be ourselves and walk behind Him. The second thing we can practice is don't practice your religion for show. To the Jews in the day of Jesus, there was three primary ways that you would practice your religion and practice your righteousness. Through giving, through praying, and through fasting. Now, not only was there nothing wrong with any of these three things, Jesus expected that to happen. And even today, Jesus expects his followers to give, and Jesus expects his followers to pray, and Jesus expects his followers to fast. But he does not want us to do it for sure. It's, he says in verse 2, So when you give to the poor, do not sound the trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men, and truly I say to you, their reward has been in full. Jesus would probably apply that same <laughs> verse today, but he might say to someone, don't expect a building to be named after you, just because you give a lot of money to the building fund. Or, don't accidentally let it slip out that you're a big giver. So people will brag on you how financially you support the church. In other words, don't give to make yourself look good. Jesus goes on to say in verse 3 and 4, But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your father sees what is done in secret. He will reward you. Now we ought to give. We ought to give generously. We ought to give gladly. We ought to give sacrificially. But we ought to give secretly. Jesus expects us to take these blessings that God has given us and use them to be blessings to other people. Jesus, ex Jesus expects us to be aware of people who are in need, to care for people who are in need, and to share with people the same thing is true about praise. He says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. Think about our own prayers when we pray. I'm guilty, we're all guilty. Jill's a great prayer. I wish I could pray like Jill. <laughs> Off the top of your head. I, I can't. I'm not, I haven't reached that part of my life yet. Our prayers sometimes can be very standardized. Routine, monotonous, no spontaneity, no spirit-initiated prayer. Prayers that are long, prayers that are wordy. We use the same repetitions over and over. And when we pray in public, don't show off. Don't speak to God in some deep voice, in some 16th century language. Just pray natural. Be normal and be real in your praying. Last Sunday we talked about prayer. A prayer doesn't have to be monotonous. A prayer doesn't have to be wordy. A prayer doesn't have to be routine or standardized. This morning, my prayer was, thank you, Lord, for waking me up. That's good enough prayer. A prayer is just talking to God, you and him. That is why Jesus talked about that secret place 
in our message, this morning, in our reading this morning. He's talked about it three times. But when you give to the poor, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to the Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will, will reward you. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will be will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But you know why this secret place is so, so important to God? When you give secretly, when you pray secretly, when you fast secretly, there is no fault. And nobody claps for your religious performance. You're not an actor. There's no acclaim. Nobody telling you how great you are at praying. What a great giver you are. What a great Christian you are. There are no awards, no plaques, no trophies telling you how skillful, skillful you are at your praying, your fasting, and your giving. When it is done in a secret place, it is just between you and God which is exactly the way God wants. Remember last Sunday, Jesus went away from the crowd to recharge his battery. He went to his secret place so it could be just between him and God. Third thing we can practice is don't prefer the applause over men, the applause of men over the approval of God. Don't prefer the applause of men approval of God. The word, oh, the, the, the reading that I want to refer to, the uh, verse I want to refer to this is, comes from Matthew 6, verse 1, we read this morning. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be <coughs> noticed by men. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The word noticed is the key word here. It's a Greek word which literally means theater. It means literally something to be stared at. In other words, Jesus said, you don't have to put a show on for anybody. You don't have to put on a Broadway production. The Pharisees were like actors. They loved to be noticed. When it came time to give or when it came time to pray, when it came time to fast, it was prime time. They had to stretch yourself spirituality. Jesus said about the Pharisees in John 12, verse 43, for they love the approval of men rather, rather than the approval of God. I like that. For they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, we, we need to understand there are certain things that we do publicly with our religion. One, we're to share our faith in Jesus Christ with other people. We are to be evangelists. We're to share the gospel with those who may not know Jesus yet. Bring them to know Jesus. There's nothing wrong with bowing our head and holding hand in a restaurant and publicly thanking God for our food. Nothing wrong with saying a blessing before a meal in public. But whenever you try to use your religion to cause other people to notice you or brag on you and to give you praise and honor and glory, and that becomes your motive, so that that's when Jesus said in verse 2, they may be honored by men. That's not our motive. That should not be our motive. Then listen to what he goes on to say. Truly I say you, they have their reward in full. The re word reward, reward at that time was a technical expression that was used at the completion of a commercial transaction where a, seat, a receipt would be given showing pay in full. That's what reward meant during that time. Jesus was saying that those who trumpet and parade their good works so that they can get applause and glory of men, receive their reward the 
moment the clapping begins. Isn't that great? And getting their reward. And it ends, the reward is over when the clapping ends. They get exactly what they're looking for. Their reward starts at the noting from people noticing it, and it stops when people turn their head. They get exactly what they were looking for. No more, no less. That's what they want. Now, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but how many of us give money to a charity or to the church just to get the tax break? <laughs> there is nothing wrong, trust me, I know, I'm an accountant, <laughs> with claiming all the legitimate deductions that tax companies when you can take it. But if your motive is giving it just to get the tax receipt, to get that deduction, then you better hold on to that receipt and treasure it because that is all you're going to get. That is the only reward you're going to get. If you don't give just because you, because you love Jesus and you want to see the work of God supported and just and to be able to see people saved and reach Jesus, if that's not all you're giving, then it doesn't matter what the IRS puts down. They can write up receipts all day long if that, in that case. But God writes down zero on that receipt because you did it and you gave it for one reason. So in conclusion, it's so easy to fake Christianity. We all know that. It is so easy to spit polish our outside image, right? But if it doesn't correspond to the spiritual image that's inside of us, then to make then to God it means nothing. It's hypocrisy to God. And you know that sets the on fire. But if you want to do, but if you do what is right and you do it with the right motive, seeking only the glory of God and not the applause of people then your Father, who sees you in secret, will reward you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you claim to know him, and you want to serve him, do it in such a way that you don't pretend to be someone you're not. Be yourself. Walk behind God. Don't serve him for others to see. And don't prefer the applause over men. Don't prefer, don't prefer the applause from men over the approval of God. Just don't be a hypocrite. Amen. Amen. And now we can stand for our closing hymn, number 220 in the red book. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.